Ron, that's right, absolutely, he's talking to the clergyman. Why, why is that important? Anything else important about that phrase? Like the tone is warm, yeah. right? My dear. He doesn't have to say dear, right? Yeah. This guy's in jail. He could be like, look, you racist pigs. <laughs> How could you let me fester in jail here for standing up for what's right, right? He could be really angry and he would understand if he were angry. I would understand. But he's not. My dear. Why fellow? He's trying to create unity separation. Not unity, I think. What's he trying to establish, Dana? No, no, no. He's a part of the Christian movement um, as well as the clergyman. So he's a reverend. Yeah, so the Reverend Martin Luther King, right? Create a more um, moral sense, I guess, like a religious sense to it. Let's take that a little bit further. Maybe, maybe he's trying. He is, does, definitely talks about religion throughout the letter. Why else would he say fellow? He's identifying with them to create a Common yes, why would he want to do that? Because, um, well, because he's, he's, you know, he's going to, um, he wants them to, he, you know, he wants them to know that he's one of them. That's right. Why does he want them to know that? Because, well, they'll be more understanding um, okay. of his position. Do you think they'll be more sympathetic? Well, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. Trevon, what were we going to say? I'm going to, sorry. Oh, um, no, that they're equal. They're That's what he's trying to get at. Exactly. He's trying to get at, we are equals, my fellow clergymen. Are these clergymen white or black? White. They're white, okay? So he's saying, I'm not just some black dude in prison, okay? I am also a clergyman. We are equals. Let's see how else he tries to establish that. While well, confined here in the Birmingham City Jail, I came across your recent statement calling my present activities, quote, unwise and untimely. Seldom do I pause to answer criticism of my work and ideas. If I sought to answer all the criticisms that cross my desk, my secretaries would have little time for anything other than such correspondence in the course of the day, and I would have no time for constructive work. What's the tone here? By tone, I mean, what's his attitude? What's, what's the feeling? He's kind of like um, defending himself. Um, Does he seem defensive? I mean, not really, but like he's he's kind of like 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 the, what he's done is um, like how they're trying to say what he did wrong. So right. like he's trying to like justify what he did. He is, and he is like, and it, does he say like, well, why are you picking on me? No. Just, no. What's his tone like? I say sarcastic. Sarcastic, but mean and sarcastic. Kind of like, well, you know, I don't have the time of my day to do that. Yeah. So why am I even gonna bother? I don't think it's quite that mean, even. Jeremy? I think it, it sounds like professional. Like he's a busy man who has a responsibility, and so he's not. He's like, yeah, not reacting angrily, which would be kind of childish. I'm probably not reading it right, but I think he's trying to be funny. He's trying to say, look, if I answered every single time someone criticized me, I would just do that. My secretary is only do that. But and he's going to go on to say, why do you think he mentions the part about his secretaries? Because he said, he could just say, you know what, I'd be so busy just doing that, I'd have no time for anything. Why the secretaries? Exactly. So what does that establish? Professionalism. Professionalism, equality, right? I'm not just some guy. I've got not only secretary, I've got secretaries, right? That's how busy and important I am. But he doesn't say, look guys, I'm really busy and important, because that would be obnoxious, wouldn't it? He kind of slips it in there subtly, right? <laughs> but, so I don't have time for this, but, <coughs> excuse me, since I feel that you are men of genuine goodwill and that your criticisms are sincerely put forth, I want to try to answer your statement in what I hope will be patient and reasonable terms. What's he doing there? We're not going to go this slow, slowly through the whole letter, I promise, but just in the beginning. What's he trying to establish there? What's he doing? For the last part, right? Yeah. Well, he's giving them credibility. He's not just dismissing them. Yeah. He's, you know, he's complimenting them. Right. He says you're a man of goodwill, right? Right. right. Uh, I'm 
Um, I feel like the but in the whole end of a sentence is kind of like, but since I feel that, he's kind of like putting them on like a level plane. Like he's not putting them up to my own pedestal, but he's also like saying like, you guys aren't much higher than I am, or equal. Like, well, like, which but? I, I'm not quite sure there. I think the but here means I'm too busy for this nonsense. But since you are well-meaning people and you, in your uh, arguments were sincerely put forth, right, he's giving them compliments. Yeah. Isn't he? So he's elevating them a little bit. Right? I don't think he's trying to put them down there. I think he's complimenting them. What introductory strategy is that? Pull off the mm, Not quite. Well, you're kind of complimenting your adversary. Oh, it's not. Um, the op-ed, op-ed, op 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 right? This is kind of classic op-ed in a way. Because he's saying, kind of, it's not exactly op-ed. But the strategy is to say, right, if he were trying to say to them, how dare you criticize me, you lily-livered fools, right, and yell at them in their faces, would they read his letter? No. No, yeah. right? So he's saying, I think you're good people. And that's why I'm going to answer this letter. So they say, oh, yeah, I'm good people. OK. I'll read that letter. Let me continue to the end. Right. Sorry, throw a bubble. I think I should indicate why. Sorry, throw a bubble. Sorry. I think I should indicate why I am here in Birmingham, since you have been influenced by the view which argues against outsiders coming in. And so how does he explain why he's there? Why is he there? of their hometowns. And just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of the Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my own hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Uh, who were the apostles? Yeah, Jesus' disciples. And what was their job after Jesus died? To spread the word, right? They had to go out and spread the word. So he's saying, it's my job. I'm, who's he comparing himself to? Jesus. Well, to the apostles, specifically, right? He's comparing himself to the apostles. How do you think that um, makes him look? <laughs> well, it's pretty good, isn't it? I mean, if we have guilt by association, right? Oh, you're hanging out with the wrong crowd, right? So you get in trouble, even though you didn't do anything. It also works the opposite way, right? I'm oh, just like the apostles who were going in to, you know. <laughs> it's not very humble to compare yourself to an apostle, right? Uh, but it's a pretty good strategy. Why is it a good strategy for this audience? Because they're Christian. Because they're clergymen, right? These are clergymen. If he can bet on anything, it's that these clergymen should share Christian values, right? And Christian heroes. So if we talk about, do you remember deductive reasoning? What does that shape look like in a deductively reasoned argument? Triangle. Good, upside down triangle, good. I didn't think anyone would remember that. Good. And what's at the top here? General to specific is for intro strategies. This is the same, because we have, in English, we are really boring with our designs. We only have a couple. So this is the same one for deductive reasoning. What's the top thing up here? Did you say something like that? The major premise? Yes, the major premise or the value. Let's say value here for the sake of argument. What values do you think he can imagine his audience will share? And when I say audience, I mean these clergymen. Christian values. Christian values, absolutely. Why? Because they're clergymen. Clergymen. Christian values, good. And we'll see if we have any others. 
you're going to see how clever he is, and he's going to kind of just seal the deal with this argument so well. Because the clergyman can't deny Christian values, right? They're clergymen. That's their job, right? So it's a brilliant strategy. Here's another one we'll talk about. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Is that opinion or fact? Is it a fact? If someone gets arrested in Atlanta, does that affect me? No, no. It depends. Um, in, a, in a sense, yes, it can because it's like you pay tax money for prison. <laughs> okay, so if we, to, to push it to the extreme, but what if they don't go to prison? What if they just are protesting? And let's take the example here, right? Do you think these clergymen believe? that what happens to some black protesters in Birmingham really affects them? No. So how does he get away with it? How does he get away with this opinion? He's speaking from the... Okay. Oh, sorry. Uh, we, Don't be sorry, speaking, raise your hand. We, he's speaking spiritually. Like, yes. Like, what kind of spiritually? Like, um, like, like he's speaking like to God, basically. He's saying, like what kind of God? Like a uh, Christian God. Yeah, he is. He is. Do you remember Christianity says, you know, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you, or, you know, what happens to my brother happens to me. In the Christian faith, in any faith really, if someone's being attacked or something bad's happened to someone, are you supposed to be like, oh, sucks to be you, okay, I'm going to go about my life, right? <laughs> or are you supposed to go and help that person out? Right? That's a Christian value, isn't it? So even though he's calling them on the fact that even though they might be like, well, what does that have to do with me? It should have something to do with them because Christian brotherhood and sisterhood would have you care about everybody, right? So he's relying on a Christian value. You deplore the demonstration. Oh, and one other thing, sorry. Never again can we afford to live with a narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. This is tricky, but I know you can do it. What's he appealing to here? It's not Christianity anymore. He's made a subtle shift. Jeremy, how do you want to answer? Patriotism? Yes, and what kind of idea? What was America? Why are we patriotic in America? It is tradition. What were we the first country to do? Establish a democracy. That's right. That's our claim to fame, among others. So democratic with a little D, not big D, because that would be like Obama versus Romney, right, the capitals, but with a small D, democratic values like, what is the idea behind democracy? All men are created equal, and everybody's vote counts, right? So you can no longer say, he says, that I, I'm inside America, so I'm not some outside agitator, right? I'm a citizen, and my voice counts. Because in America, we say every voice counts. You don't have to just be a landowner. You don't have to just be a man. Anybody who's a citizen's vote counts, right? So he's appealing also to democratic values. And what I want to show you throughout this essay is this two-pronged approach that Martin Luther King takes. He appeals both to Christian values and to patriotic democratic principles. And the idea here, I think, is that his clergymen that he's talking to would certainly not deny American patriotism that they're patriots and would, could never deny that they're Christian, right? So uh, all men created equal. That's one of the big things, too. Where does that come from? That's right. That's one of the founding, that's the founding value of the Declaration of Independence. Very good. A document with which these clergymen would have been very familiar, of course. You deplore the demonstrations taking place in Birmingham, but your statement, I'm sorry to say, fails to express a similar concern for the conditions that brought about the demonstrations. So you don't like the demonstrations, but you're not thinking at all what led us to the demonstrations, right? What are the causes here? And then he, and he says we had no alternative. And then he goes on to outline his four stages of a nonviolent campaign. 
And what are those four stages? Collection of facts. Great. It starts with the number one, collection of facts. Why is that important? You have to know what your campaign begins. Well, yeah, that's right. You have to know that this is not just like, oh, we just felt like protesting today, right? <laughs> There's actually segregation happening, there's racism happening, here are the facts, are we sure that there's a situation here? Yes, we are. And the same idea was present in the Declaration of Independence. In the Declaration of Independence, our forefathers said, you know what? It's human nature to kind of hang on and, and, and put up with things as long as you can. But when things get so intolerable, finally, you have to rebel, right? You have to act out. A similar thing. What else does this collection of facts do? Well, it makes him sound logical and reasonable, reasonable, doesn't it? He's not just, you know, some crazy protester, right? He's actually got a very reasoned plan. What's part two of that? Negotiation. Negotiation. And what example does he give us in the letter of them trying to negotiate? That they have, um, they have talked about it and they agree to do certain things, but they didn't do it. Who agreed? The political. Okay, some political figures. And the shop owners, right? He gives the example that we asked the shop owners to take down those signs. What did the sign say? Do you think? White and color. White only, maybe, right? We asked them to take down those signs. They took them, they said yes, took them down for a couple days, and they're right back up again. So saying we tried to negotiate, which also makes them seem reasonable, right? Like logical people. What's number three? Self-purification. Self-purification. Is that a sea salt scrub in the day at the spa? No. No. What is self-purification? Introspection. Um, to make sure that what you're doing is correct. And can you undergo what you're going to have to go through? Yes. Very specifically, it has to do with how you react under duress. And what specifically did he say about that, Michaela? Are you able to accept blows without retaliating? Are you able to endure the ordeal of jail? Excellent. And why is that so important? Because, I mean, if you get socked in the face, are you going to retaliate? That's the question. It's the question of what do you have peace in front of you? Well, you might be justified, right? An eye for an eye, right? We see even footage of those people getting the hoses turned on them and the dogs, and you just kind of want to wail on those policemen, don't you? But why not? Why is that not okay? It goes against everything that they're standing for. Yes. And what else? Yes, it goes against everything that they're standing for, so of course not. What else is important about it? Because, um... He wants to um, say that he's abiding by the law, and the yes. law says that they're allowed to have peaceful demonstrations. Yes, and so if he follows the law to the letter, he can't be accused of breaking the law. What other advantage is there to not having all the protesters go nuts and riot violently? No bloodshed. Well, no bloodshed. Michaela? Um, it looks better on their cards, only because like if they're not showing violence in the courts, they're like they can prove and show that they haven't shown any violence towards the people that are against them. Yes, that's right. Jeremy. Just so that um, everyone can see that that hate is one sided. Yes. Also, right? If they are just absorbing all of this violence, right? How does it make the policemen look? Really bad, mm -hmm. right? Really hateful. If they were to retaliate, they might actually be giving some fodder to people who are racist, right? To a stereotype that, you know, if we allow um, blacks equal rights, then there's going to be chaos and mayhem or whatever they were thinking in their minds, right? It would give them some negative evidence, right? He doesn't want to give any of that. Good. Very good. Uh, and so he talks about why direct action, and we talked about what direct action, direct action was. And then he's going to talk a little bit about waiting. One thing before that. I'm at the bottom of paragraph 10. I know it's hard to follow along because I have different, I might even have different paragraph breaks, so I'll try to read slowly. It's right in the, towards the end of the paragraph about Socrates. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bottom of the myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. Who was Socrates? He was, Dana? Was he dumb? No, he's a pretty smart guy, right? 
the grandfather of philosophy. What is, so how does Martin Luther King look in comparison to Socrates? Um, well, he compares the pious to the impious, like who's holy and who's not holy. So he's trying to evaluate who's good and who's not good. Okay, but Socrates also stands up for what he believes, right? Yeah. He actually dr drinks the hemlock. He drinks the poison rather than uh, rather than run away and escape when he's accused because he says, you know, I was for democracy, I'm going to stand up for it, right? So it's a pretty good comparison for Martin Luther King to be comparing himself. He looks pretty good by comparison. What's a gadfly? Who looked it up on their vocab list? Okay. Oh, a gadfly is a fly that flies around the horses. Yeah, it's a little fly that nips at the horses, so the horses go, you know, and move and twitch and move their tails and their manes and everything, right? It doesn't hurt them. It just nips at them a little bit. So what is the metaphor here that he's using? It's actually a simile. What's the simile here comparison with him and society? Okay. Someone who um, persistently fights with their, you know, advocating about arguing people and fighting against. Yeah. We have to always be present and be complaining a little bit, like the squeaky wheel, right? Because otherwise, that horse, society, isn't going to move, right? There's going to be no change. Everything is going to stay static. And we've been waiting a long time. And he's about to go into his weight section. He says, we know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. I'm about two paragraphs lower than where I was before. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Frankly, I have yet to engage in a direct action campaign that was, quote, well-timed in the view of those who have not suffered unduly from the disease of segregation. For years now, I've heard the word weight. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This weight has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. Right, because what are these clergymen saying to him? It's really not a good time for you to be equal. You know, not a good time for me. Could you just hang on a little bit? You can do it. Hold on. We'll take care of it eventually. But really, you know, not such a good time. Right? And he's like, no. Enough with the way. We have waited for more than 340 years for our constitutional and God-given rights. Notice this two-pronged, right? Our constitutional, the Constitution, and our God-given rights. And throughout the essay, you'll see that two-pronged approach. The nations of Asia and Africa are moving with jet-like speed toward gaining political independence, but we still creep the poor somebody pace toward gaining a cup of coffee at a lunch counter. What's going on in this letter written in 1963? What's going on in Africa and Asia? Why is he mentioning them? No, good guess, but not quite. Politically in Africa. Yeah, exactly. Africa and Asia had been colonized, right? By the English, by the Dutch, uh, by the French. And in the 60s, we saw a big move of countries gaining their independence, right? Kenya became independent. Uh, many countries became independent. And so what he's saying is, blacks in other countries said, you know what? Thanks, but no thanks. We got this. <laughs> We're going to rule our own country. Get out, please. Right? And they had, for the most part, fairly peaceful uh, rebellions that ended in uh, blacks, actually, you know, Africans and Asians leaving their own countries, right? But how does that make us look by comparison? What are we trying to struggle for? A cup of coffee at a lunch counter, right? It seems just so silly, just so ridiculous. And you can imagine these clergymen, who would have been very patriotic, right? How are we feeling in the 50s and 60s after World War II in America? What have we just done in the world? Okay. Save the world? Yeah, we consider ourselves the saviors of the world, right? Our technology, I mean, we use the F bomb, right? Our technology is through the roof. We can do anything, we think, right? We have clothes dryers, we have washers, the only countries in the world. TV. Sorry? We have TVs, we can make green jello. I don't know if we should have, but we have the technology and we did it, right? We have 
bread with preservatives in it so that now you don't have to have your bread, bread go bad. You can truck bread across the country and people don't go hungry anymore. We can feed people a lot better than we could before because food stays on the shelf. Right? We found out later, of course, you know, we also have pesticides, a ton of pesticides. So now you have crops that yield an incredible amount of food all of a sudden. No more hunger in America. It's pretty amazing, right? Um, two cars in every garage. Of course, we didn't realize the Frankenstein implications at the time of a lot of these things we were doing, which we're realizing now. Uh, but at the time, we were on the top of the world, right? So to compare Africa, which we have seen as, you know, a fledgling developing country in need of our help and civilization, right? They're moving at jet like speed and we're at horse and buggy, right? We're way back in the past. It's going to prick at the pride, right, of these clergymen. Do you think he also means like, well, might as well we just stay in Africa and you didn't, you know, just come and pick us up because now we would have been free and we're here supposedly come for a better life and we're still slaves and we so still come for a better life. That's right. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> right. Right. So maybe he's mentioning Africa also. Like, look, our brothers are even free, and we're trying to. You know, I don't know because he's going to make the point a little bit later that we are Americans too, and I'm yeah. talking as if I'm black today. I hope you guys don't mind. But he's saying, you know, we're we're Americans too. We are the foundation of sorry, <laughs> we're the foundation of this country, right? He's saying we built this country too, and it's outrageous that you're not letting us have a cup of coffee, right? So I'm not sure about that. Let's let's put a pin in that for a second. Perhaps it is easy for those who have never felt the stinging darts of segregation to say, wait. So what's he saying? He's saying, it's easy to say, wait, not a good time, if you're not the one enduring the indignities of segregation, right? And what's about to follow is my absolute, hands down, favorite example in the whole history of literature of the use of the semicolon. Because I'm going to read to you a sentence that is just brilliant. And uh, we're going to talk about it. So I'm going to a drink because I will run out of air way before I run out of sentence. He says, you know, perhaps it's easy, all this stuff, and it starts here. But when you have seen vicious mobs lynch your mothers and fathers at will and drown your sisters and brothers at whim, when you have seen hate-filled policemen curse, kick, and even kill your black brothers and sisters, when you see the vast majority of your 20 million Negro bro brothers smothering in an airtight cage of poverty in the midst of an affluent society, when you suddenly find your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her eyes when she is told that fun times close to her children, and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky, and see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness toward white people. When you have to concoct an answer for a five-year-old son who is asking, Daddy, why do white people treat colored people so mean? When you take a cross-country drive and find it necessary to sleep night after night in the uncomfortable corners of your automobile, because no motel will accept you. When you are humiliated day in and day out by nagging signs reading white and colored, when your first name becomes nigger, your middle name becomes boy, however old you are, and your last name becomes John, and your wife and mother are never given the respected title Mrs. When you are harried by day and haunted by night by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at tiptoe stance, never quite knowing what to expect next, and are plagued with inner fears and outer resentments. When you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. That's all one sentence, and it's grammatically correct. Why do you think he chose to use semicolon then? When do we use semicolons? Usually. To list or to connect two sentences that are very closely related, right, that follow one after the other. Uh, why do you think he chooses a semicolon? Ingrid. Well, to show that he knows good grammar, but he's really smart, he's got a PhD, so maybe, but I think he has another reason. And this is like a master's class in writing, right? 
because when you choose, many of you are probably used to thinking that you use semicolons or punctuation just to get you know, the basic meaning across, right? Just to use it. But really, the most ideal use of punctuation is a way that complements your meaning. And here, he's used a semicolon in a way that, that complements what he's trying to say. It actually ties into the meaning of what he's trying to do. How do you think that could be? Andres? Well, like, when I read it, it would kind of be like one, like when I see periods, I take a pause, but if I see a semicolon, I would just keep going and going and going, and yeah. I kind of go, like I wouldn't take a break, or I wouldn't That's right. like breathe, I guess. So to me, just seeing all that would overwhelm me, and then like kind of like, I don't know, not panic, but more like, like realize, or think about it more in depth as to just seeing it cut up by periods. Yeah, how does that fit in with our theme? Exactly what you're saying is completely right. How does that fit in with our theme? What are we talking about here, people? What is the topic of the sentence? What's the subject we're talking about? Yeah, wait. Waiting. Jeremy, what were you going to say? Uh, basically, it, like, it's the segregation has never stopped, and they never get a moment's repose. Yeah, we don't get to have a period. Yeah. You don't get to say, oh, you know what, I'm just not going to be, no one's going to be racist to me today. I'm going to take a little period of time out, right? Because that's not the way it works. It's unrelenting. It doesn't stop. There's no break. How else does this function? If this is about waiting, what has he made us do? I think he's, um, by stating all of this in one sentence, he's trying to invoke in them um, the emotions to create a passion with them, to, um, to see that, oh my god, all these things are terrible, of course we can't wait. Yes, he is definitely doing that, absolutely. We're going to talk about that. Dana? I feel like he's um, <clears throat> setting up a story within a story, giving the people a vision of the waiting. Yes, he is. It looks to me so, like more poetic by using like everything starts with when. Okay, there's the repeat, right? It's almost like a, this repetition, right? When you, okay? But, but let me get to this part. What is he making us do as readers? Wait. wait. We've got to wait for the end of his sentence. When you, 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 when you. There are literally 12 or 15 clauses in this sentence. So you, audience, can tell me to wait. Well, then you sit there and wait for the end of my sentence. <laughs> and while you are waiting for the end of my sentence, how about if you experience some of the things it feels like to be black in this country, right? And why does he use the second person? He could have said, when I, when I have to explain to my daughter, when I have to do this, when I have to sleep in a car. It's not, it's not, you know, it's not like a person. It's when you address me, you don't want to be like, well, me. You want to be like, well, my brothers and sisters, where are you speaking for everybody else? But it's not when we. It's when, when you. It's second person here. That second first person is I, right? Second person is you. Why you? When you. He may never. So the character might feel like more intimate. Yeah. When you use the second person you, they have to feel for a second within the confines of your sentence. Being that person. Experiencing what you're talking about experiencing, right? And there is this repetition for sure, Walker, you're right. The when you, when you, when you, it lets you feel how you just never get a break from this. It just is constant, 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 right? So when you have done these things, do you think these clergymen have ever experienced any of these things? No. No? What's the life of a clergyman, you think, in the 60s, a white clergyman in the 60s? What's their life like? Give me some details. What about, are they married or are they not married? Sorry, the white picket fence stream, right? They get a house to live in, a rectory, right, associated with the church. Are they married? Yeah. Yes. Do they have kids? Yeah. Usually, right? And what kind of status does the wife have in the community? Miss and Mrs. First Lady. Yes, it's Mrs. It's Mrs. Reverend whatever, right? So they get a lot of respect in the community, especially in the 60s, right? Um, so these particular examples are also well suited, right? Can you imagine? These clergymen have to imagine for a second what it would be like if their missus was disrespected, right? If they were called names, if they were called boy, right? A reverend in society gets a huge amount of respect, right? At least in the 60s. Um, good. 
What other examples does he give? What about this example of the daughters, the daughter and the son? The unconscious bitterness towards white people for some reason, Claudia comes in the line. You know, Claudia from the blue side? Good, okay. She's describing exactly how she ended up feeling. Nice. That's great. Excellent. Cut that away for your mentor. Also, it's like the, the practice midterm. Um, they raise, they, they put race, and children view that the hate, and it's children from innocence because they're not, they're growing up to not be children. They can't even play in the park. Right. And it makes them violence. It makes them some of them might go insane. It makes them feel worthless. And That's right. Like the and he mentions nobodyness. Right, which is certainly a topic that Tony Marston addresses. He says, when you have to concoct the answer for, a, oh, sorry, let me start with the woman, with the daughter. Uh, your tongue twisted and your speech stammering as you seek to explain to your six-year-old daughter why she can't go to the public amusement park that has just been advertised on television, and see tears welling up in her eyes when she's told that Fun Town is closed to colored children. So certainly an experience that these preachers would never have had to experience, right? Nothing close to their children, probably and see ominous clouds of inferiority beginning to form in her little mental sky, and to see her beginning to distort her personality by developing an unconscious bitterness towards white people. What is he appealing to here? In the first part of the sentence, he is certainly appealing to pity. I think we'd be pretty hard-hearted not to feel something when we're reading those lines, right, about the daughter being disappointed and finding out, no, I'm not equal, and how come, right? It doesn't make any sense. But in the second half of that, the second clause of that idea, I think he's appealing to something else, and it's not pity. Tradition. Well, I'm saying appeal, and that's what so can you say logical fallacy, so I'm sorry, I said that the wrong way. Do you think these preachers care about what happens to a little black girl? No. They should, because they should, right? They're preachers. But do they? Maybe not, because then. For example, when she was black, when she put the color in her face, they treated her different. That's right. That's right. What do they care about? He's appealing to them being parents. He's appealing to them being parents, but I think that's part of the pity thing. What about these ominous clouds? What's in, what does ominous mean? Numbers, bad. That's threatening. Threatening. Dangerous. So, what is he trying to get them to think of, Brittany? he wouldn't even want to deal with it. Right, right. So he's threatening a little bit. Creating he's monsters. He's basically, a, uh, you creating a monster. Yeah, he's appealing to their self-interest. If you don't, you should care because you're a preacher, but if you don't care about what's happening, you should care about the fact that a whole generation of kids is going to grow up to hate your guts and be bitter towards you. And he said, uses the word ominous, which means threatening, right? Violence, hatred, he uses those words, right? Those are not, that's not what you want to encourage, right? He's kind of making them scared a little bit. Good. The only other thing I wanted to say also about um, second, well, he's also appealing to tradition, I should say, just to back up for a second. Because of the traditional ways that they're treated, the traditional family, all of that is taken away from a family that uh, has to withstand racism, right, and segregation. Um, one other thing I want to say about uh, you. When he uses you, as Ricky was saying, um, if he were to say I, 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 he might get the response like, oh, that's terrible, I feel bad for you, that's too bad, right? But when he uses you in second person, you kind of can't escape it, right? It's not just their problem, it's your problem now, which is the idea he's trying to get across, right? Or this inescapable mutuality, uh, interconnectedness, right, of everyone. I knew I'd find that thing I wanted to find. Okay, he talks about civil uh, disobedience. He talks also about, uh, uh, you know, he, he talks about, I'm going to just read a couple of things, and if you can't find it, don't get too stressed out. I'll try to go slowly so you can, but uh, he talks about the just laws, as we talked about in the quiz. St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in internal law and natural law. He says all segregation statutes are unjust because segregation distorts the soul, something preachers should care about, 
and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Buber, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up relegating persons to the status of things. Right, which is not a very Christian idea. He says later in that paragraph, thus it is <coughs> that I can urge men to obey the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court, the court is morally right. What was that decision of the Supreme Court? Brown versus Board of Education, that's right. Segregation illegal. And I can urge them to disobey segregation ordinances where they are morally wrong. So he's trying to speak now to the idea of people saying, well, you're just breaking the law. It's the law that, segre that segregation is legal in the South. And he's saying, well, this is why I'm justifying breaking the law. He says, an unjust law is a code that a numerical or power majority group compels a minor minority group to obey, but does not make binding on itself. This is different to made legal. And then he says, let me give another explanation. OK, so all of those things he's talking about is morality up to that point. St. Thomas Aquinas, right, appealing to which value? Christian, right? Now he's going to flip it and appeal to your democratic sense. He says, let me give another explanation. A law is unjust if it is inflicted on a minority that, as a result of being denied the right to vote, had no part in enacting or devising the law, right? The idea behind democracy is that everybody's vote counts. He's saying a lot of the blacks were prevented from voting. Therefore, this is not democratically legal or just. Who can say that the legislature of Alabama, which set up that state's segregation laws, was democratically elected? Throughout Alabama, all sorts of devious methods are used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. And there are some counties in which, even though Negroes constitute a majority of the population, not a single Negro is registered. Can any law enacted under such circumstances be considered democratically structured? No. Jump down a couple of paragraphs. Do you see what he's trying to do? He's trying to lock his audience into realizing that if you agree with these major values, there's no way you could ever in a million years say that segregation is right. You just can't do it. So if you get to the end of his, if, if they're still reading and they get to the end of his letter, they can't help but say, okay, we either agree that segregation has to go or we're just racist, right? He's really locked it in, very beautifully. Uh, he says, of course, there's nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. It was evidenced sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Mesach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hungry lions and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. Right, the early Christians were fed to the lions. Did you all, you've heard that before, right? They were willing to be eaten by lions rather than say, oh no, I don't believe in Jesus. Right, that's pretty amazing to think about, right? We all say, oh, we stand up for what we believe. But if there was a lion out there who was gonna rip you from limb to limb, it's pretty hard, isn't it? I mean, that's a pretty amazing person, especially when there were no antibiotics, no surgeons, right? <laughs> it means something else to stand up for your beliefs. Like, I'm willing to die to say, I believe in X, Y, Z, and walk out there, and because you believe it, and you're not willing to say no, nope, like, how easy would it be to like, be like, Jesus who? Oh, fine, you know? Like, <laughs> I'll just go pray in my own room, right? And nobody has to know. How easy would that be? Right? And yet throughout the history of the world of human beings, there have been human beings willing to stand up for an idea, for a principle. It's pretty amazing, I think. Uh, and so he's comparing himself to those early Christians. Of course, our preachers have to value what the early Christians did, because otherwise there'd be no Christianity, right? If there weren't some people early on willing to say, you know what, not so sure about all these multiple gods, I believe in this one God, then uh, there wouldn't be Christianity. Go ahead. And he really did stand up for them because he lost his life behind what he believed. Martin Luther King. Yes, that's exactly right. Yes, you're right. Good point. Sad point. Uh, to a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our own nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. What happened in the the Boston Tea Party? 
Oh, only the, the only the international students know. Every time, that's it. Oh my God. <laughs> they they throw. They, they don't want to buy anymore. He from the England, and they just throw everything uh, in the ocean. Yeah, they said, you know what? They said, that's enough. We want freedom. We've yeah. had it with your taxes. All that tea in the Boston in Boston we Harbor. Take your tea, tea and shove it, right? We're gonna drink coffee. Welcome Starbucks, right? Uh, <laughs> and they were sick of it, right? It was an act of civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is an idea that goes way back. Um, obviously, as you can see, the Socrates is where you choose your, your conscientious objector to a certain law, and you say, I'm not going to follow that law because it's not right. Right? You could say, you know what? I don't like how you're using my taxes. Thoreau, Henry David Thoreau, an early American thinker and writer, uh, refused to pay his taxes because he said, you know what? I don't like how you're paying my what you're doing with my tax money. I'm sure all of us is tempted <laughs> at some point, but you go to jail for that. You actually go to jail for that, right? So you have to be willing to do some jail time, like Martin Luther was. But notice here in his examples, he's got the early Christians and then Boston Tea Party are democratic values, right? We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal, and everything the Hungarian freedom fighters did in Hungary was illegal. Why does he bring up Hitler? Because he, he had no, like, just he wanted to just to take that race and just make it disappear. So it's basically what he said if we keep with this segregation, we will just, we can't take it. We have to disappear, or, you know, you're killing us just like Hitler was killing all these people. Okay, so you're making that comparison good. <laughs> it's also relevant because it was just the end of World War II. Yeah, so we're just coming, you know, not just 20 years, but still, that's a, it was a pretty big deal, right? We're still riding high from that, right? We just defeated Hitler, and it's true that segregation uh, is a kind of form of, you know, it, it's not that far from ethnic cleansing, right? It's the next step. What's the next step if it goes the, the wrong way, right? Yes. Yeah, Hitler was with brown eyes and brown hair, and he was Taurus like me. <laughs> but he would believe that just he needs to kill everybody with brown hair, and it, it's only, it's got to be just white people with blue eyes. And, and Hitler is for us in America, right, the ultimate, now he's been replaced by other people, but certainly in the 60s, the ultimate evil, right? I don't think there are many people named Adolf anymore in this country, right? <laughs> the ultimate symbol of evil, yeah. right? So, but his point is, were you just saying Ingrid? Yeah, also that um, it was illegal in the beginning, it was right. That's right. That, that time, it was illegal. Exactly. An example of how sometimes it's moral and noble to break laws. If there's a law enacted that is a terrible law and cruel to people, it's your moral obligation to say, I'm not going to follow that law, right? Mm -hmm. um, he says, uh, <coughs> Excuse me. It was illegal to aid and comfort a Jew in Hitler's Germany. Even so, <coughs> I'm sure that had I lived in Germany at the time, I would have aided and comforted my Jewish brothers. If today I live in a communist country where certain principles dear to the Christian faith are suppressed, I would openly advocate disobeying that country's anti-religious laws. Right? He's saying sometimes it's very important to do that. Uh, and then he talks about... I just love the way he... With one letter, he he walked all over the world. He went to Africa, to China, to, to Macedonia, then to Germany. To like he you went, to to he went all over the world and 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 show the issues and, and everything and, and is trying to say we're still supposed to be the number one country and we're behind yes. all these other countries. I think it, I, I do really believe that there's no way you could read this letter with any attention and not come to the same conclusion he does. I just don't see how it's possible. Um, that's good writing. He says his problems is the things that have been stumbling blocks to getting segregation repealed. Uh, the Negro's great stumbling block in this uh, strive for freedom is not the white citizens council or the Ku Klux Klan, but the white moderate who is more devoted to order and to justice who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. Who constantly says, I agree with you in the goal you seek, but I cannot agree with your methods of direct action. Who paternalistically believes he can set the timetable for another man's freedom. Who lives, in a con <coughs> lives by a mythical concept of time. And who constantly advises the Negro to wait for a more convenient season. Who's he talking about here? Oh, just an average life. Specifically, do you think? Who's he trying to twist the knife? 
Well, let's remember. Let's back up for a second, like we have to when we're mid article and say, what's the thesis again? Hold on, who are we talking to? Who is this letter directed to? To clergymen who have told him what? Wait, wait. It's untimely and unwise, your timing, right? So he's saying, you know who's my biggest enemy? You. You. That's exactly what he's saying. It's the white moderate who says, you know what? I kind of I see where you're going, but you know, not a good time. Just hang in there. Right? It's not that bad. Right? <laughs> um, he's saying you're my biggest stumbling block. That's right. Very good. Okay. Let me jump ahead a little bit. He says, I'm skipping like a whole page of my page. You speak of our activity in Birmingham with extreme. You guys all follow up on that. It might be on your following page. You speak of our activity in Birmingham as extreme. At first, I was rather disappointed that fellow clergymen would see my nonviolent efforts as those of an extremist. I began thinking about the fact that I stand in the middle of two opposing forces in the Negro community. One is a force of complacency, made up in part of Negroes who, as a result of long years of oppression, are so drained of self-respect and a sense of somebodyness that they have adjusted to segregation and in part of a few middle class Negroes who, because of a degree of academic and economic security, and because in some ways they profit by segregation, have become insensitive to the problems of the masses. So he's outlined that he's, he's stuck between two things. He's outlined one of them. What's the first one? What's the first problem to, to ending segregation? What's he talking about here? So he's talking about the white moderates. And now he's saying, you know, even within the black community, there are two extremes that I'm stuck between today. Negroes that have no sense of uh, self-worth and uh, middle class middle class Negroes and um, national uh, black nationals. Yes, party. and he's going to so people say, oh, it's not so bad. It's better than being slaves, right? The people who say, you know what, let's just hang in there, right? He says that's more dangerous. So it's between that and extremists, and what do the extremists want? Uh, they want segregation over race. They they believe white people are the what? the nationalists, the black nationalists. Did they actually want segregation to continue? The black nationalists? They want separation of races. Did they? I was not aware of that. That's really is that true? Yeah. yeah. I remember. I what I know yeah, is that Malcolm X said a ballot or a bullet. Yeah. Right. So we either give us you know all equality or it's going to end in bloodshed. Right. He was definitely saying you know what this can't have a happy peaceful ending. It's not going to work that way. Um, I believe you if you say it. I totally believe you. I just wasn't aware of that. Um, he says his other force, the other force is one of bitterness and hatred, and it comes perilously close to advocating violence. It is expressed in the various black nationalist groups that are springing up across the nation, the largest and best known being Elijah Muhammad's Muslim movement. Nourished by the Negro's frustration over the continued existence of racial discrimination, this movement is made up of people who have lost faith in America, who have absolutely repudiated Christianity, and you have concluded that the white man is an incorrigible devil. So in that last sentence I just read you, how do we have these two things expressed? How do we see the Christian value expressed? Or the danger? It's a Christian value. Um, or something like that. What word does he use specifically? Repudiated Christianity. Excellent, Remy. The, these extremist groups have repudiated Christianity. What does that mean? If you don't know what repudiated means, I can see where you might miss it. What does repudiated mean? It's like you, what I, when they say, isn't it like when they say, I repudiate Jesus' name? Like, it means I renounce and I deny, yeah. right? They are not, they like, no Christianity, right? Repudiate Christianity, don't believe in it. Uh, and what about the other part? What about the democratic? Where do you see that? Excellent. They've lost faith in America, right? We're really talking about two faiths, right? We're talking about Christian faith and American faith, right? Patriotism and the faith of America, the great, right? Good. And he says, it's a good thing that I'm in between these two things and that the church has helped me. And he reminds them also that he's part of the church movement. That's not just him on his own as a renegade, that this has been uh, the movement of the black churches. He says, I am grateful to God that through the influence of the Negro church, the way of nonviolence became an integral part of our struggle. If this philosophy had not emerged, I'm, by now, many streets of the South would, I am convinced, be flowing with blood. What is that? 
What's he trying to say? A threat. I don't think it's light. Flowing with blood? That's yeah. a pretty big threat to me. It's not like, oh, it might be uncomfortable. You have to step over that blood, right? Just flowing with blood, right? That's pretty extreme. He's saying, you know what? I am not your worst nightmare, people. Your worst nightmare is if you don't follow what I'm saying, it's going to be much, much, much worse, right? Isn't that what he's saying? He starts a little bit. He says, and I am further convinced that if our white brothers dismiss as rabble rousers and outside agitators, and that's exactly what they said to him, right? He directly responded to them. Those of us who employ nonviolent direct action, uh, and if they refuse to support our nonviolent efforts, millions of Negroes will, out of frustration and despair, seek solace and security in black nationalist ideologies, a development that would inevitably lead to a frightening racial nightmare. I want to just question, by threatening them with the blood, he also is showing that it, you know, it's enough, they're tired, and it, it doesn't make any more sense for them to go on like this, so they don't even care anymore if, if it's going to be blood. They believe in what they believe in, and they're going to fight for it, and they're not going to stop a, a, a step back, and this is it, you know, if you don't follow, you know, it, it's it's coming. It's, it's you know, you created this monster, and it's yes. coming for you. Yes, and it's also in our we have historical precedent, right? Our American patriotic forefathers. Yeah. There was bloodshed, right? It wasn't like a, King George said, "Oh, great, have the country. It's all yours," right? I mean, we had the American Revolutionary War, right? It says, but though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continued to think about the matter. I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? And now, look at these examples and notice how we're going through these two values, right? And he gives the example of the person and then immediately gives us a quote right after the supports of, of in their own words. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. What have all those examples been? Sorry. What kind of examples are these? What do these guys have in common? They're martyrs. They're Christian martyrs, that's right, they're Christians. And John Bunyan. Now what are we going to flip into? The Americans. Here are the patriotic American examples. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. Isn't that Martin Luther King right now? He's yeah. in jail for what he believes in. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. He comes out and says it, right? It's that main tenet of his whole argument here. So the question is not whether we will be extremists, but what kind of extremists we will be. Uh, he talks about the crucifixion. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of this. But he says, you know, for the church to be relevant, it's becoming an irrelevant social club, he calls it. Because the church's job had always been to stand up for people and what they believe in, and the church is not doing its duty, he says. But the judgment of God is upon the church as never before. If today's church, and this is also a kind of threat, right? You're going to be obsolete. Your jobs are you're going to be out of a job soon because you won't have anybody sitting in the pews if you don't get real and start dealing with social issues like is your job. If today's church does not recapture the sacrificial spirit of the early church, it will lose its authenticity, forfeit the loyalty of millions, and be dismissed as an irrelevant social club with no meaning for the 20th century. Every day I meet young people whose disappointment with the church has turned into outright disgust. Um, so he's saying it's going to be just the old people in church, so there won't be any young people anymore. Uh, finally, we will reach the goal of freedom in Birmingham and all over the nation, because the goal of America is freedom. Abused and scorned though we may be, our destiny is tied up with America's destiny. Right? And this is the idea that he introduced earlier, where this fabric of mutuality, right? And he's talking about uh, black Americans. Before the Pilgrims landed at Plymouth, we were here. Before the pen of Jefferson etched the majestic words of the Declaration of Independence across the pages of history, we were here. For more than two centuries, our forebears labored in this country without wages. They made cotton king, they built the homes of their masters while suffering gross injustice and shameful humiliation, and yet out of a bottomless vitality, they continued to thrive and develop. 
If the inexpressible cruelties of slavery could not stop us, the opposition we now face will surely fail. We will win our freedom because the sacred heritage of our nation and the eternal will of God are embodied in our echoing demands. Right? The sacred heritage of our nation? What is that sacred heritage? All men created equal and standing up for what you believe in, right? That's why we were founded. Freedom, right? And the eternal will of God. We got both of those values in almost every sentence, almost every major sentence, right? Okay, I think we're done. Um, yeah, I'm going to stop here to see, make sure you don't have any questions. He says, I've never written such a long letter at the very end. I hope you'll forgive me. You know, he just comes back to his humor a little bit. <laughs> He says, if I have said anything in this letter that overstates the truth and indicates an unreasonable impatience, I beg you to forgive me. If I have said anything that understates the truth and indicates my having a patience that allows me to settle for anything less than brotherhood, I beg God to forgive me. So again, we got these ideas. Okay, uh, any questions for the mentor? Before uh, I leave, it's Thursday. It is Thursday. You need your green book. Uh, you should write your outlines at home. You do not have to write an outline inside. You will not be allowed to use notes. Okay. Oh, can we bring notes? For the no, you cannot. You can study on it right up to the minute and then put it away. But you can't. You know, like, <laughs> uh, the sample The sample is pretty similar to the idea that it will be the same. The same setup. Uh, I actually did put two questions, but they're fairly similar, so it's okay with me if you kind of mix and match and cobble together a paragraph of your own, right? So uh, the way to prepare is really look through the West Guide again, the chapter on how to ace the exam. Make sure you're covering your bases there with looking at the notes, thinking of the themes, making an outline. There will be an image, uh, there will be two images actually that you'll be asked to come choose one to talk about. And incorporate and incorporate it to your essay. Other questions? Yeah, Do you have an extra outline? You mean a practice essay? Practice, yes, I have an extra practice. Other questions? No, I have two much better pictures than that that I can't uh, wait to show you. I'm really excited. I'm really good pictures. <laughs> you said the, art, the other article that I'm going to be doing. Yes, basically what, what it is, is you're going to have to talk about Blue's Die. You're going to have to talk about Blue's Die because that's the quote, right? So you're going to deal with the quote. Then you're going to talk about the question underneath. The question, or in one case, I've given you kind of a statement to defend. Uh, and then you can talk about any of the articles that we've read. So you certainly you're talking about Blue's Die. You're going to talk about one of the pictures. So that's two things for sure. Then I'd like you to talk about Martin Luther King. I'd like you to talk about... Um, you, you, then you have the choice. You can talk about fresh faces, you can talk about victims from birth, you can talk about imitation of life, you can talk about Shirley Temple. That's as you like, right? You can people it with the evidence that you see fit. So then you have a question. Yes. So for example, let's say we pick a quote, and so we start with a, a kind of introduction, and we talk about the first paragraph after a week of the thesis, and then the first paragraph we talk about the quote, and what happened before and after maybe the quote. Uh -huh. And then later on, um, we can add the, some of the other articles and talk about what they all have in common, or? Yeah, I think maybe the way to organize it might be to, to have a paragraph on the other side then. So you talk about the quote, then you give other examples that are similar or that talk also about the theme that you're talking about. Then you'd say, uh, while this theme is apparent in um, the, Blue Sky, races and the article Fresh Faces also talks about it, and then you're off and running in Fresh Faces. Then you say, the picture illustrates, and I'll give you the title of the picture when we get to it. Um, it also illustrates this, that, or the other thing. Right? So I think I would organize it by the text that you're talking about. By text, like, could be the movie, could be. Do we need to include Martin Luther um, I would like you to talk about Martin Luther King. And just a heads up, I think the best way to talk about it is to concentrate on that weight speech that we talked about. I think that that's probably the easiest bridge um, in my mind. But I've seen students do some other exciting things with it. So I would like to have you write about Martin Luther King. Other questions? I'm thinking, I'm not going to be counting paragraphs. 
So, and I'm not going to be taking off for grammar or spelling, so you don't need to get worried about that. Uh, you know, I think five or six paragraphs is probably good. What I want you to do when you leave, and always, I always worry about students who leave early from the exam, just because I feel like, really, are you sure that you said everything you can? I mean, you know how detailed I am, how much I like, like really looking at things and giving examples. Like, really, you'd rather go get a coffee than cough up one more example that's going to get you 10 points? Like, that's a choice. I'm not judging anyone. Well, I kind of am judging, I guess. I, haven't really, I don't remember anyway, but I'm always surprised. So. Maybe you're so well prepared that you can just, you know, zip it all out and you're all done. That's fine. Just be sure that you've really given me what you can. Because remember, at the end of the day, all I can do is judge what's on the page. I know, you know, don't be like, oh, she knows I know that. Well, I don't really know it unless it's on the page, right? Your grade isn't your potential, it's what's there. So hedge your bets and don't take a risk. Make sure you put it out there on the page so that I can see it and give you points for it. Um, and if you run out of time, you, know, you want to jot down an outline and some bullet points that you would have gotten to. Other question? I think you're all going to do really well. It's a fun exam. It's exciting. If you've enjoyed the reading so far, you'll have fun with it. It'll be good. Okay? If you haven't, I'm sorry. But fly be free. I'll see you on Thursday.